Turn with me to Jeremiah chapter 29, please. Jeremiah chapter 29. Usually when I do some traveling like this, I write down the name of the church and uh, on my phone. Uh, and I write down, you know, the name of the pastor or whoever. And, I, and um, it's been a long time. I've more than 20, 24, 23 years or so that I've been here. But I wrote down the name of the church and the name of the pastor. And that's all that's there. And I'm saying, Lord, what do you want me to share? And I've had that for several weeks. It's been there. And I've had nothing, nothing written down. And last week, the Lord put in my heart this, just this phrase. God is not finished with you. God is not finished with you. He has never ignored his plans for your life. Let me repeat that. God is not finished with you. God is not finished with you. And he has never ignored his plans for your life. And I want you to know that. I'm going to share that message with you from Jeremiah chapter 29, verses 10 to 14. Jeremiah 29, verses 10 to 14. If you have your Bibles, please uh, look in there. And if, you, if your Bible is digital on your phone or whatever, that's fine. But I kind of like my paper. Bible. All right? I don't, I don't knock anybody or put anybody down for having your digital stuff, but I, I like the paper. For thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil. I'm reading from the ESV. And I think the King James Version says, plans to prosper you. Is that right? Yeah. And uh, But actually, you know, in Hebrew, it's none of these. It says plans for peace. Yeah. It's shalom. Okay. Plans for welfare and not for evil. To give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and will come and pray to me and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. God is not finished with you. God is not forgotten. And he has not ignored his plans for your life. Have you ever asked God, Lord, did you forget me? Have you ever said to the Lord, uh, Lord, you remember me, Alexi? <laughs> I'm still here. You, do you remember? Have you ever cried out to God and said, Lord, what about me? I mean, you bless so many people that have read about it. I've seen it, and I've seen it in your word, but Lord, what about me? I feel like you've just left me where I am, and you've just passed on. Have you felt that? Sometimes we're afraid to verbalize that to our God. We're kind of afraid. Or you want to walk away from the window when you verbalize that. You know? <laughs> like, we're afraid to say things, but you know, God is not afraid of our words. He's not afraid of us or our emotions or whatever. He's not afraid. He's secure in who he is, you know. But I've said that. I've said, Lord, I, you, still, you still remember me, Lord? This is exactly what the Israelites felt with their land was destroyed their nation was utterly, completely flattened out. All of the important cities, important monuments, important buildings, everything in their cities were wiped out. You remember when the Twin Towers came down? By the way, I grew up in New York City. That's my hometown. Watching those buildings come down, it was rough. That was rough. I remember my parents, we were in India at that time, we were sitting there, 
my mom was just going hysterical. My my dad was just like very silent. He just it was rough. Because see, the, it wasn't just the building, but it, it's what it represented. I mean, the building is steel and all these other things, but what it represented, and for the for the city and for the nation as well, it represented something, right? And so for the Israelites, they saw their temple, the king's palace, all of the important buildings leveled down to the ground. So they're watching this. They're like, what is going on? So the Babylonians, they come in. By the way, these Assyrians and especially these Babylonians, they are a ruthless people. They come in and tear up and they tear down and they destroy and we cannot say in public all the crazy things that they would do to human beings. 596 BC, the king of Judah, his name was Jeconiah, or Jeconiah. Jeconiah was taken away and all the important people of the city were taken away. And anybody who had any kind of skill, education, or any kind of uh, uh, background in life, they were all taken away. And the only ones that were left were people that were considered to be peasants, people that lived hand to mouth, and people that could not think about tomorrow, just, just about today, that meal. And then we'll think about the evening meal at that time. I mean, it was people like that that were left. And then there was a new king established by the king of Babylon. Imagine another nation. You just imagine this. Another nation deciding who will rule your country. <laughs> you couldn't think about that. You would say, wait a minute. We decide, don't we? No, no, no. The Babylonians came in. They took over the land. And they're the ones. They took the king away. And they're the ones that installed somebody else as king. And you say, what right does another nation have to come and, and decide who will be our ruler? That's what the Babylonians did. And so they were upset. So the new king, Zedekiah, struggled to have a proper relationship with Babylon, and it was a problem. And so he kept sending emissaries, representatives to Babylon to talk to the Babylonian king, Nebuchadnezzar. Back and forth, they were sending letters and everything. During that time, Jeremiah wrote a letter to the exiles that were already there. Jeremiah letter, he wrote a letter, and he, this is the basic content of the letter. In Jeremiah chapter 29, you can read that, those few chapters. But he wrote a letter to the exiles that were taken away, and he told them, look, now that you're in that land, I will, the Lord is saying that he wants you to settle down in that land, submit to the king, plant crops, and plan for a long term that you're going to be there. And the people were upset. They're like, Jeremiah, what are you saying? We don't want to be here. We want to be in our own land. We're in a foreign land. We're like, we're like nobody here. We don't want to be here. We want to be in our own land. Jeremiah said, no, no. This is God's plan for you right now. You stay there. They were angry with Jeremiah. And they sent letters back through someone. And they said, put this guy away, with Jeremiah. Okay? And there was a, uh, and, and the people there that were in exile, that were listening to a, a false prophet, his name was Shemiah. Shemiah. He was a false prophet. And who said, Jeremiah is not prophesying from God. This is fake stuff. You got to put him away. Caused all kinds of problems. Because who is right? Who is true? When, so when they hear the words from Shemaiah, who says, no, 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 God's going to deliver you. He's going to take you back. They like to hear that. They're like, oh, this, is, this, this sounds good. But what Jeremiah is saying doesn't sound good. I don't like that. You know, so it's like, you know, which prophecy do you choose? Well, you choose the one you like better. Or do you choose the one that's coming from God? <laughs> you know, And it's not what I like, it's what God is saying. So God says, look, you're going to be here for seven years. So relax, take it easy, 
submit to the king, plant crops, and just plan for a long time of living there. And they were upset. So we go now to verse 10. And I'm going to share with you three things. Let's look at verse 10 one more time. So it says, Thus says the Lord, When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you, and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. Number one, God has planned for you. Okay? Just write it down. God has planned for you, for your life. Maybe you're young, maybe you're in your teenage years, or maybe you're in your 30s or 40s, or beyond that, wherever you are, God has plans for your life. See, we may not understand this plan. We may not even agree with this plan. We may not even be sure about this plan. But He, very clearly, has plans for your life. You might say, wait a minute, the way my life is going doesn't look like there's any plan at all. My plan didn't work. And, and how could this be God's plan? Look at the destruction. And this is what the Israelites were facing. They're like our land is destroyed. Our king has been torn, taken away. And they they decided somebody else to be our king. They're like, what is this? This is ridiculous. You know, some other nation doesn't come in and decide who's going to rule us. This is crazy. They were upset. But God said, look, I know the plans I have for you. You see, he said, when the 70 years are completed, and the people are like, 70 years? What are you talking about, 70 years? They didn't want to hear that. But God said, look, this is my plan. 70 years, when it's completed, he said, I will visit you, and I'll fulfill my promise to you, and bring you back to this place. And then verse 11, for I know the plans I have for you. I'm sure you've heard this verse before, right? And, and when you look in the Hebrew, you know what it says? For I, even I, know the plans that I have for you. It's like that I is repeated twice. I, I know the plans that I have for you. It's like, it's almost like God is saying, why are you doubting? God is saying, I'm the one that made the plan, and it's my plan, and I'm the one that's talking to you. What is that of doubt? What is that? It's almost like God is saying, I don't get it. I'm the one. I made the plan. I'm telling you the plan. And we're like, uh, I don't know, Lord. <laughs> I, that reminds me of what Jesus said to the people. You people call me Lord, Lord, but you don't do what I say. It's like, why bother calling me Lord then? You're making that word meaningless when you don't do what I say, when you don't obey me. Then don't even bother calling me Lord because it's meaningless then. See, it's almost like that. So God is saying, I, even I, I'm the one who made the plans. I am the one that set the plans for you. You may not like it, but he said, this is my plan for you. See, we may even disagree. Much beyond what we are facing right now. So you might say, but I have, I have had all these plans set up for my life. Goals I have set. Prayers that I had. I wrote it down, Lord, and I prayed, and I prayed, and prayed. It looks like there's a deviation here. It looks like I'm going through another route that I did not expect. How could it be? God is saying, look, I have seen your life from beginning to end already. And we can get that into our minds. God has seen your life from beginning to end already. We see today, we see this moment, and we may be fearful about tomorrow for all the years to come, but God is not fearful at all. There's no sweat on his upper lip wondering, what am I going to do with his life? What am I going to do with Alexi's life? Or what am I going to do with Pastor Bill's life? He's not upset. He knows. He's not worried about tomorrow. He knows. Why? Because he has seen 
our life from beginning to end already. He knows where it's going. Recently, I, I, was, I, was, I read a tweet by somebody. Someone was asked to describe Jesus in one word. And the person said, relaxed, relaxed. And I also thought, that's quite unusual, relaxed about Jesus. And he said, the reason is, he said, see, Jesus had already seen his life from beginning to end already. God already had planned for his life, and Jesus knew those plans already. He knew what was going to happen to him, how he would die, how he would be buried and resurrected. He knew it all. So you look at that, and, and I remember I mean, I, a few years ago when I turned 50, I wrote a blog post. Life is a setup. I wrote a blog post that said, life is a setup. And the reason I said that is because I said, look at Jesus' life. His life was already planned out. He knew exactly. You've read the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you'll see where it says, oh, this happened so that the prophecies might be fulfilled. Yeah. Hundreds of years before Jesus' birth, it was prophesied about Jesus. Now, the prophecy was only hundreds of years before, but you know what? The plan is way back. The Father had planned everything out from the beginning of the ages. And it was only revealed to people through the prophets a few hundred years before. So when Jesus' life was going on and the people were writing, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were writing about it, they said, well, Jesus did this, said this, or went to this place and said, so that it might be fulfilled what the prophet said years ago. So Jesus knew exactly that everything was set up according to the Father's plan. And then I thought to my mind, I thought, so the sufferings of Jesus were pretty much like calculated. Where he knew that I'm going to get through this. It's going to be, there's something at the other end. No matter what happens, although he was going to be tortured and killed, hanging on that cross, still he knew that his end was going to be back with the Father. So it didn't matter so much. It was all a setup for him. But then I thought, and this is what I wrote in that blog post, then I thought, what about me? What about you? What about you, 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 each one of us? Doesn't God have that same plan for his children, meaning us? That one day we will be with him in heaven. Whatever the future holds, it could be wealth, poverty, it could be health, or it could be lack of health. It could be sickness, it could be trouble, or it could be with none, none of those problems at all, like an easy life, which many, many people do have. And whatever it is, whatever it is, we know that our end, our future, is going to be home with our Father. So for me, my life is a setup. For me, for us, our lives are already set up, just like Jesus. So God has plans for your life. Now, you might have imagined some things for your life and for your future, but then when there are deviations, we get upset. We get uncomfortable. We might get angry. We might get frustrated. We might have tension and all these things like, it's not going according to my plan. What's going on with my life? And God isn't stressed. At all. He's not surprised by anything. Let's look at verse 12. Then, then you will call to me. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me 
with all your heart. So the second thing I want to share with you is this. Your relationship with God is the key factor in working out God's plans. Your relationship with God is the key factor. You might think, i got to plan it out properly. i got to work hard at this. i got to do this. i got to do that. Yes, we need to do what we need to do. I agree. But for God, your relationship with Him is beyond anything else. Parents know, and this is Mother's Day, right? Parents know that more than anything else, you just need that connection with your children. That's it. That the love, the care, and that connection with your children means everything. And even if they don't give you any gifts or anything, they don't have to give you anything, but the love and the connection means so much more. Same thing with the Father is doing. See, God's original plan for the Israelites was that they would be his people and he would be their God. See, he wanted an intimate relationship with them. That was the plan. But the people began to think of other things and they're like, oh, okay, now we're the people of God. And they began to think of themselves as something awesome and great and wonderful. And all these other people are horrible people and we are special people of God. That wasn't God's plan. God's plan was that they would be like a missionary nation to the rest of the world. That all the people of the world would come to Jerusalem. That all the people of the world would come and have a relationship with Yahweh God. That was God's plan. But the Israelites, they messed it up. They're like, no, we are special. And the rest are all Gentiles. And they even use terms like they're all dogs. Okay? We are the special people of God. But that wasn't God's plan at all. Even from the time that Abraham was called, what did he say? I will make you into a great nation. Through you, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. How's that? This is it. He wanted the Israelites to be a missionary nation. He wanted them to be a priestly nation. What do the priests do? Stand between God and people. He's a mediator between God and people. God wanted the Israelites to be like that. A mediator between God and all the peoples of the world. That's what, they, what God wanted. Instead, they got their mind mixed up with other thoughts. Trying to think of themselves as great and wonderful. That's not what he wanted. And that's one of the reasons why God sent the Babylonians and the Assyrians to come and take over the land. And take him to a foreign land for 70 years. What's the purpose of the 70 years? Purification. Giving them some time to think. You ever put your kids at, uh, what do you call it, time out? Just sit down there for a little bit. And you might think, well, you're not, you know, you're not beating them. You're not torturing them. You're not doing anything to them. That's pretty much like torture for a little kid. Right? They sit there for that. That's, that's torture. But that gives them, what is the purpose of that? One of the primary purpose of that is to give them time to think. It really is. It's giving them time to think about this. Otherwise, they'll be running around thinking about nothing. <laughs> but giving them time to think. God gave the Israelites 70 years to think. See, God said, look, I gave you the Sabbath. I gave you the Sabbath as a day of rest. And for so many years, you haven't been doing it. You just do your own thing. You had your own plan. And God says, I'm going to give that land rest. All the years you haven't given it rest, I'm going to give, the, give rest to that land for seven years. You're not going to cultivate, you're not going to do anything. The land will have rest. So go away. So he sent them away for seven years. So the first thing I'm sharing with you is that God is a plan for your life. Whatever you're facing right now, no matter how confusing it is, no matter how frustrating it is, no matter how crazy it may be, He has a plan for your life. And it's His plan. And He knows it. And we don't need to teach Him. Okay? Nobody needs to tell Him. He knows His plan. Second thing is that your relationship with God is the key factor. And you might say, but I need to do this. I have my to-do list. Yeah, that's, that's nice. 
to make sure at the top of your to-do list, make sure it's connect with the Lord. Make time to spend with him. But what do you do? Huh? You know, I, I told you about my parents. You know? They sang, they prayed, they read the word, they cried out to God. They just were in God's presence. That's all it is. They just spend time for that. They were working too. They're working hard, raising three kids right in the, in, in the city, in the Bronx. That's what they were, raising their kids. They were immigrants from another land, trying to live and uh, uh, trying to live in their life in a, in a foreign land. They don't, uh, they're not that familiar with the language or the culture or anything. But one thing they knew to do was to sit before God and to pray and to pray and to spend time with God. See, we might think, what a waste. No, no, it's not a waste. No time that you spend with God is ever wasted. I'm just watching the clock. None of it is ever wasted. You see? God is in control. All right, number three. God is not finished with you. God's plan will not be ignored. God is not finished with you. His plan will not. So last verse, verse 14. Let's go there. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. I will bring you back to the place where I sent you into exile. See, the place where they, where God had them in, the, in, in, in Israel, that was God's plan for them. And I don't have the time to talk about this, but that was the place God had for them. But God tore them from that place and put them in another location. And it looks like it's out of God's plan. And your life, your life right now may look like it is out of God's plan. It definitely may be out of our plan. Okay? And it may even look like it's out of God's plan. But you know what? God has a purpose in all of it. For the Israelites, the purpose was to purify them and to bring them back into a proper relationship with God. That was it. That was it. For them. Now, for your life, ask the Lord, what's going on, Lord? Is it just, you know, a stop off in the road to where you want me to go? Or is it a correction? Or is it, is it something that you are trying to build in me? You're trying to develop something in me? These are all possibilities. Or could it be like the Israelites? There was sin. There was sin in their life and God was correcting them. It could be any one of these. But I, I can't stand here and point fingers at you. That's not my purpose. But rather than that, say, Lord, would you show me? God is speaking to us right now. And I and I'm just have, like to pray for you. And uh, you, you can be seated, but but while you're seated, I'm just going to pray for you. As you pray, would you just look within you and say, Lord, what is going on in my life? Would you come and reveal your plans to me? Reveal your plans to me, what you have for me, and what is going on in my life. Okay? Would you close your eyes for just a minute? Come, Holy Spirit. Lord, from the beginning of this message, from the time I gave the topic, you have been speaking to several people very clearly in their hearts. And I invite your Spirit right now to come into our minds, our thoughts, our emotions, and our bodies. Come, Holy Spirit. Lord, I remove every doubt. I remove fear. Come, Holy Spirit. You take over, Lord. You take over. Let your power come. Let your spirit flow. And bring strength and healing to the emotions where there is brokenness, where there is strife, where there is tension and stress. I invite your spirit to come and minister your healing, Lord. 
Just wait just a minute. Let, just, let the Spirit come. Let the Spirit speak to you. In your inner being, let the Spirit speak to you. Come, Lord. Come, Holy Spirit. Oh, Jesus. You're faithful, Lord. You're awesome. You're kind. You're so generous, Lord. Even when I don't understand, even when everything seems like a mess. Lord, I, I, I have trouble believing, but help my unbelief, Lord. Father, let faith rise up in your people, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes. With the comfort of your spirit and the strength that they be built up, Lord. Lord, I thank you for this opportunity to come and share your word. After so many years, I bless Pastor Bill, his family, and his church, and the generosity, the open heart that they've shown toward the ministry in India, Lord. Thank you for that. Lord, as we have shared your word, pray that your spirit will continue speaking and ministering to people in the coming days. Thank you, Father, what you're doing. Thank you for the, the words you've been speaking to us. And thank you for what your spirit is doing within us, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you so much for giving this opportunity. God bless you all. Yes. Amen. I encourage you to pray for the work in uh, all of our missionaries, but especially India. I, I know I make it a big emphasis but because the field is so great. Um, he mentioned this morning, I hope you can calculate that in mind, four times the number of people we have in the United States in India, in a country that's just a little bit bigger than the size of Texas. It's smaller than the state of, the state of Alaska. So if you imagine four times the number of people in the United States jammed into that one area, you can see the poverty that's involved. You can go online. It's not that hard to go online and see the things that are happening in India today. And they need you to do what God would encourage you to do. And I would challenge you this morning, whatever you feel like doing, by the grace of God, allow Him to, to instruct you, to show you, and every blessing we give, prayers and finances, God will give back to us. I challenge you this morning with the scripture, I think you know I've put it to you more, than, more times than one. Give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. God wants to bless you, running over, that you can be a blessing to others as well. And so I encourage you this morning, if you haven't brought an offering, if you bring it next week, we'll make sure he gets it next week. I tell people this all the time. We don't take postage out of the offerings. We pay for the postage to make sure. That, and I say that because some, some groups do that kind of thing. And I praise God this morning for the faithfulness of the men and women, the young men and women that are in, the, in India today. Um, I can say I trust them wholeheartedly because I trust the Lord and the Lord has blessed them. We stand with you this morning as we're dismissed. Father, I thank you today for the word of the Lord. I praise you because I know that you are the almighty God. I ask, Lord, in Jesus' name, on this Mother's Day especially, that you will bless our mothers. I pray, Father, that you will help them to uh, receive into their heart the blessing of the Lord and allowing them to understand that literally the next generation depends upon their faithfulness to God in teaching these children. I praise you, Lord, for what you're doing in Washington, D.C. now for the babies. And I ask in Jesus' name that you allow the Holy Spirit to minister so that mothers will be so caring of their children that they will be jealous for their future. I ask in Jesus' name that you will draw us closer to you every day to help us, Lord, to have life and to give life as it pleases you. Bless Lord Brother George. Bless his family. I pray that you give them healthy grandchildren. I pray that in the name of Jesus, you will allow the Spirit of the Lord to make a way that is easier than it has been and encourage them in the name of the Lord. As we ask you these things, I pray, Lord, as we go to our homes, that you will keep us from harm and danger. Help us to praise you and glorify you day by day. And we're thankful, Lord, because we know that you know what plans you have for us. There are plans of blessing and good. Help us to seek you with all our heart to have a relationship that would please you so that you might answer those with prayers. And we'll thank you as we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Shake hands, be friendly.
ladies meet at the back door. We have flowers for you. God bless you. Happy Mother's Day.